my pleasure today to welcome to PDY's Dr. Dan Stoltz. Dan is a retired physician who was diagnosed with Parkinson's 14 years ago at the age of 57. He practiced internal medicine in San Angelo, Texas for 28 years and became the president and CEO of the Shannon Health System. Dan served as president and CEO of the Texas Hospital Association as well from 2007 to 2014, working on medical and health policy. He also served as a guest faculty member at the Texas A&M Medical School in Round Rock, Texas, and retired in 2016. He and his wife, Alice, live in Georgetown, Texas. And Dan, I would be remiss if I didn't say happy anniversary, belated, happy 50th anniversary. <laughs> You Thank have. you. Welcome to PDYs. And, and by the you. way, Alice has been putting up with you for a long time. Yeah, 50 years. 50 years. Well, delighted to, to celebrate that with, with both of you. And, and thanks for being here. I've looked forward to this conversation for a long time. So uh, for those who don't know you, let's start by having you tell us about yourself and, and your career in medicine. I, I grew up in, well, thank you. And thanks for the compliment. I grew up in Dallas, went to Hillcrest, uh, played basketball there, was recruited to Southwestern here in Georgetown to play ball. Played there for a couple of years and then decided that I was never going to make it to the NBA. So I focused on studies, went to the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. And then I would do a residency in Kentucky because I knew that I probably would never leave the state otherwise. So I spent three years taking care of Eastern Kentucky patients, which is a real view into public health and or the lack thereof. And when not any money or emphasis is put on uh, the hollers, as they used to say, it was uh, in a, a bad situation. But anyway, and then I moved to San Angelo to join a small group. I knew I didn't want to work in a big city. And uh, we had 26 physicians when I joined. We had 174 when I left 28 years later. I went to THA because it was an opportunity to really switch professions, going from the direct care of patients to uh, lobbying on behalf of health policy. And I'd had that in my blood. Uh, in fact, if I was of a different generation, I probably would have had a master's of public health. But uh, going into health policy is very interesting for me, very stimulating. I did that until after my first DBS surgery. And once that uh, performed and I did well, I decided that it was best to tell the board that I was leaving because I didn't want the board to tell me it was time. And to my knowledge, I didn't have any cognitive problems then, still don't for that matter, but I didn't want them to tell me it was time to go. Yeah. I worked a little bit at the, as an executive in residence at the medical school here in Round Rock, but, uh, and I was on the curriculum committee, which is interesting, but uh, not really did I make an impact. I was on the sidelines most of the time. And so that wasn't a significant part of my career, although I'd like to have thought it would be. They were good to me. And uh, I retired full time in 2016. Well, let's, let's pick up there. And um, I have a lot of questions I wanna ask you, uh, particularly in light of your, your background and experience as a, as a doctor, but um, let's start with how you discovered you have Parkinson's. Uh, when were you diagnosed? How did that diagnosis come about? I, I, I was diagnosed in November of 2007. And I'd had a little tremor in my right hand, but I thought it was an essential tremor because when I took a beta blocker, it seemed to help. And uh, I was on a beta blocker at the time for hypertension. But I got mixed signals from uh, Annie for one uh, and friends about how my tremor was doing. So I found the movement disorders specialist that I'd heard actually give a CME talk, continuing medical education. 
went to see him and he told me the first time, he said, I think you have Parkinson's. Uh, I'm not sure, I wanna test this a little bit more. And he put me back on the beta blocker and it didn't make any difference. So I was diagnosed in 2017. In retrospect, I probably had it uh, 2015, a little thumb tremor, just barely. But uh, I didn't have any alteration of taste or smell or anything early on. It was just a right-sided tremor. And my left side had no tremor, which is not uncommon, but I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. And you're right-handed, correct? I'm right-handed. Yeah. So, I mean, Parkinson's, as you and I both know, it's different for, for different people, right? It's a snowflake disease, the disease of one, we often say. You know, what's Parkinson's like for you on a daily basis? I've had it 15 years, and it changes. That's the one thing that I... I know it's true is if you, like you say, if you've seen one, you've seen one, but likewise, if you've seen one year, you've seen a different year the next year. So I do a lot of things now that are focused on Parkinson's. Uh, it's, a, it's an up and down disease. Even with DBS, it's an up and down disease. And uh, I find that one day I don't think I can put on socks and the next day I'm doing fine and going through that and getting on my shoes and going outside. Uh, it just varies a little bit. Yeah. One of the things I appreciate you about you is um, your, your, your candor and your humor. And, you know, you and I got to know each other a number of years ago and, and friends and you've, you've been, you know, an important companion for me on my own journey, but one of the things that I think is interesting and, and I appreciate is that you, you refer to Parkinson's disease as the animal. And you've written about this on PDYs and you've talked about it in some talks that we've been together at. Um, where did that come from? Why, why the animal? Well, it's kind of interesting. It's a, it's a uh, stalking beast. It uh, attracts and attacks all the time. It's waiting for me to trip on a chair or fall outside or get over industrious and it will pounce. It's chronic, it's at you all the time. It just seems like an, a personification of an animal that's hunting us, a bear or a tiger, et cetera. And it's, uh, it helps me to, to uh, personify it, to give it a, character mm -hmm. it's always lurking um i'm looking out on my backyard and there's deer running across in sheets so i got a little distracted mm -hmm. uh no, another animal a better yeah, animal. another animal yeah a better animal uh and i don't know it just it gets interesting rather than saying parkinson's parkinson's disease over and over and over um the animal things seems to fit yeah. Yeah, I like I like that metaphor a lot. And I, I talk about it as a beast as well. And I for for me, you know, um there are beasts that can be tamed, right? Maybe not domesticated, but you can tame them a little bit at least. And and for me that to kind of play the metaphor out, it, it it's it's important to, to me anyway to to think in terms of of taming the beast, if not domesticating it fully. It can right. be, Aim that it is, and so I. Um, but I like the way you you use that that image a lot. I think it has a lot of value. Um, what are some things that have surprised you about Parkinson's, Dan, for for better or for worse, or maybe for both? Uh, for both is I was surprised that I knew so little about it. Mm -hmm. I was an internist. I practiced. I diagnosed Parkinson's, but I didn't know anything about it in retrospect. I didn't know that it presented most of the time with asymmetric symptoms. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that uh, tremor might not be the first symptom that you could lose taste or smell or have stiffness as the first symptom. I was schooled right out of the uh, textbook of typical Parkinson's disease in medical school. And so I didn't go any, I didn't learn any more about it. So I've been surprised at all the angles. How it minimizes you and reduces you. 
and tries to, again, the animal metaphor, it tries to, to uh, make you smaller and make you not come out, make you retreat, make you silent. Every bowel habits, libido, uh, speech, handwriting, all in an effort to keep you down. Yeah. And I, th I, uh, I find that very interesting in, in looking at other diseases, hypertension, enlarged prostate, uh, of diseases that are my, of my age. Right. And nothing else does that. Nothing else has that character of belittling you, if you will. Right. Into uh, uh, into making you think that you should be quiet and you should not do anything and be sedentary and yeah. just stay low. Yeah. Only Parkinson's does that. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you say that you knew so little about Parkinson's, and I, I appreciate that because, um, I mean, anecdotally, uh, I, I was misdiagnosed by a very fine physician, actually a, a general neurologist who, who didn't know a lot about Parkinson's. This, this neurologist knew a lot about other neurologic disorders, but, um, you, you know, told me I had, um, you, you know, a, a benign tremor in my left index finger, a physiologic tremor is what, what it was called. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I subsequently learned that about 25% of people are misdiagnosed. And right. Even, you know, even for seasoned physicians who are, are very fine practitioners, clinicians, it can be hard to diagnose. Um, and you're, you're saying that, you know, it, when you were in medical school and, and it probably hasn't changed all that much, um, you don't get a lot of time on Parkinson's, right? No, I mean, it's not, it's not hardly a, get any, it's like nutrition. Nutrition is a lot better than it used to be, but we didn't get very much at all about nutrition back yeah. in the day when I was in medical school. Yeah. So all the, all the more important if you have access to a movement disorder specialist. And as, as you and I talked about as recently as a week or so ago, there's a, a shortage of neurologists anyway, right. and even more of a shortage of movement disorder specialists. But having said that, if you can be under the care of, a, of an MDS, that's, that's really important. Um, Anything else surprise you for, for, for the good? Uh, well, it, I find that I don't, uh, this is a little complex, but I find that I don't see Parkinson's as a fatal disease. I see it as a part of my disease burden. It's like hypertension, high cholesterol, just added into the group. I have degenerative shoulders and degenerative knees not from Parkinson's disease, but from trauma. Yeah. I've had three back operations, not related to Parkinson's disease. So I have issues that I have to take care of every day, chronic back exercises, but it's just another burden to yeah. uh, list. It's not, um, what do you say? It's not, I don't feel a death sentence, if you will. That may be a little harsh, but that's the truth. Yeah, I, I think I get where you're coming from. How, how you frame a life with Parkinson's really has a lot to do with how you experience it, right? If it's right, I mean, we, we established that you know Parkinson's isn't itself a, a fatal disease. It can lead to complications that you know get tricky at later stages for sure, but. Um, I like the idea of, of thinking about it in terms of one among many burdens that, that people are faced with. I think that, for me, that's helpful too. Yeah, I, I didn't sleep well. I slept well when I was practicing medicine. I didn't sleep well when I was at THA, but now I really don't sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so me it's either. just one, one more aspect of the disease or the illness, as you say. Yeah. No, I, I agree. So I, I know you do a lot to, you know, take care of yourself. What are some of the things you do um, on a daily or weekly basis? Well, again, I do back exercises twice a day. I do voice training through Dallas Voice Project, which is a very good online instruction. 
I do, I read out loud from one of five texts. Uh, instead of reading uh, the three wolves or the Goldilocks, if they have me do it Parkinson, at Parkinson's Voice Project, I read either from the Declaration of Independence, Gettysburg Address, MacArthur's farewell to speech to West Point, or uh, a couple of chapters, not chapter, a couple of openings of Mo Moby Dick, Great yeah. American Literature. Uh, why? So, Go ahead. Why, why those documents or texts instead of- I don't get tired of them. Yeah. I don't get tired of them. I could read the Declaration of Independence over and over. I read a lot of about our founding fathers, mostly Jefferson. Mm -hmm. uh, and I give all that as cognitive therapy time. Mm -hmm. I count all that making knives or working in the shop, working in a welding project. All that has a purpose and I count all that as therapy. Mm -hmm. So really I'm involved in therapy, writing. Um, when I go to Home Depot to get stuff, I count what I'm doing cognitively that helps me, helps me uh, train, so to speak. So I would say half my day is directly about Parkinson's. And then, and then I box three times a week. I didn't mention that. Right. Yeah, I think the cognitive piece is a, is a really important one. And you know, the, the research, as you know, shows that you know, as any of us age, we need to attend more to our cognitive abilities and there are things that we can do, you know, just as we do to, to enhance our physical health or, health or to maintain it, we can do cognitive exercises too, reading, speaking, counting, uh, multitasking, right? Because of executive functioning can be right. Parkinson's. I can't sing, but singing is part of that spectrum too. For the voice, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, what else do you work, work on? You mentioned your shop and, and your knives. I know you, you make beautiful knives. What, what else do you work on these days? Uh, I've kind of run out of projects. I built a tree house in the backyard for the grandkids. They don't hardly ever play in it. And uh, I'm looking for a welding project. Uh, but I, I'm involved with some other organizations in town. I try to walk. Uh, but... It's boring. Mostly I piddle in the shop when I'm not building knives. I got six in the queue now, so hopefully I'll be productive once this cedar settles down. Two or three more questions. Um, where's the science in Parkinson's currently? Where, you know, what, where's mm -hmm. the energy? Where's the smart money on better treatments or cures? Well, I think it's kind of twofold. One is retaking or relooking at all the old drugs. Uh, uh, they're repackaging some of these drugs in once a day doses. And my doctor thinks that that may be advantageous. Uh, the other front is on new drugs. And the problem is a blood brain barrier. Drugs that uh, you see on television, Humira, Embryo, uh, rupixent, uh, drugs that are used for psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis that I used to use in practice when I was treating arthritis patients are now being so, they're, they're such strong inflammatory, anti-inflammatory drugs that there's some evidence that if you could get them across the blood-brain barrier, you might get a good response to Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the money is on new drugs. I don't think we're going to find anything that we've already been using with any big revelation. Big revelation. It'll help some people to change their dosing so it's more, more easy to take or they, less, they make less drug errors. Yeah. Medication errors, I found, is something that I'm very prone to. I make my pill pack. 10 days in a row, and I do it when I'm not distracted, but I still find mistakes. And so I don't think they're gonna find a big surprise in the drugs we have. The hope is that we can find an anti-inflammatory that you can get across blood-brain barrier. Uh, my doctor might have a better explanation for other options. 
uh, but that's my take. Yeah. I think the drugs you use for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis have been used for thyroid disease, ex the exophthalmus you get with thyroid disease, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, osteocolitis. So the anti-inflammatory uh, family of drugs is getting huge. Yeah. And the hope is that we might find one of these that we can attach something to to help it get across the blood-brain barrier. Yeah. What gives you hope, Dan? I, I know you to be a, a hopeful person. Well, Annie and I were talking about this the other day. And I don't mean to get real philosophical, but it is what it is. Uh, what gives me hope is that I didn't know what I was going to be doing when I was 72, 50 years ago. Uh, and in one sense, Parkinson's has not changed my life because I didn't have a plan for what I would have at 62. I could very easily have had three bypasses or a broken hip or some other disease. So I'm just in a word playing it out. I'm just doing the best I can a day at a time. And I think that's, that's optimistic. That's, uh, you know, when James was in Ranger School, they said, just get to the sack every night, take one day at a time and just do the best you can. And that's, that's my hope. Uh, and the other hope I have is that I don't look back at the end and think, you know, what if I had been exercising? Or what if I had done this? What if I had, done... I don't want to look back and second judge myself and try to outguess myself on what I did. It's a little theological, it's, it's pretty existential. I mean, uh, it is what it is and I've got it and there's no doubt about that. And I'm doing the best I can with what I get in terms of medicine and exercise every day. Uh, and, I, and in terms of hope, I don't hope for, I don't think that some drug is gonna come out of the Western sky to salvage me. I think that this will take its toll and like hypertension and high cholesterol and other drugs uh, or other diseases, it'll, it is what it is. It'll be what it will be. And I'll accept that. I mean, I'm 15 years into it and I'm still pulling on the, ch the rope on chainsaws. So I feel pretty good. Yeah, you're still driving the <laughs> tractor too, I noticed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I mean, today, today I, is what we have, right? I mean, I, I, I exactly. Time, today is what we have. And I tell myself that, I tell my kids that, my, my family, my wife, today is what we have. Well, and if you worry about 10 years from now, you know, it's like Lincoln said in the Gettysburg for score, we don't live by the score of years. We live one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it that way, in terms of scores of years, everything looks pretty black because when you're, you're born, you start to die. I mean, you can't look at life as a 20 year venture. It is what it is, it's a day at a time and you're grateful for what you have. Yeah, well said, well said, my friend. One more question for you. Um, you've been on this journey a while, you've got a long way to go, but you've been on it a while. If there were one or two things that you could say to your newly diagnosed self and by extension say to others who are just getting on the Parkinson's road, what, what would they be? Three things. One, find a movement disorder specialist. Don't be satisfied with the regular board certified neurologist. Number two, learn all you can learn because ignorance is never bliss. You need to get as smart as you can, as fast as you can. And third, stay as active as you can. Get up off the floor six days a week. No, six times every day. And it seems early, easy early on, but it'll get more difficult. But if you get up six times a day off the floor, the animal, animal will never get you. <laughs> uh, 
activity is the key because once you lose something, it's very likely that it's not coming, coming back. I don't get on ladders anymore. I'm through with ladders. I'm done with ladders. I mm. fell last Christmas and uh, I got the message, stay off ladders. Yeah. Well, keep reminding yourself of that. I, that I'm not is, sure. I'm not sure what's going to be the issue this year. Maybe chainsaws, but we'll see. <laughs> well, I would never bet against you, my friend. <laughs> An inspiration to me and, and someone I count as a dear friend. I'm grateful for all that you do for the community and, and for me personally. It's really a, a joy to have you on PD Wise. And uh, thank you. And I'll, I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you for having me, Alan. Bye. Bye. -bye.